Well, look at you guys. You made it in through the snowpocalypse of whatever that inch and a half was. No, really grateful that you guys are here. And not to shame those of you that are joining us online. I kind of did that on accident. Sorry about that. Uh, but so glad you guys are here with us for week three of our journey uh, through Philippians. Uh, we've said from the very beginning, um, I've tried in my language not to call it the book of Philippians, which we naturally uh, call it in our Bibles, because it's not a book. Uh, we've understood together that this is a letter that we are picking up one side of correspondence. Uh, we think around here that when we talk about the Bible, uh, it's really important to read the Bible literately. Now, there's a lot of talk about reading the Bible literally, but I think literally is very important as well because when we understand the genre of literature that we're reading in this vast library called the Bible that God has given us, it helps us live out the right story. And so we've discussed that the book of Philippians is a letter to the church in Philippi. And so like any great uh, literature professor, and I'm not going to put myself in those shoes at all, but I think it's important to know the author and the audience if we're going to understand it correctly. So over the last couple of weeks, we've discussed that this letter is written by Paul. And Paul has a fascinating uh, story because at one point of Paul's life, he was trying to stop the Jesus movement. He wanted nothing more than for this whole kingdom of God through Jesus thing to like go away. And then one day he was traveling and God uh, miraculously had this communication with him. The resurrected Jesus stood before Paul and said, why are you persecuting me? <laughs> I want you to do a 180. I want you to tell everybody, Jew and Gentile, Jew and everybody else about me and what I am up to in this family that I am creating. And so Paul ends up having this crazy 180 from being a persecutor of the Christian movement to being its strongest proponent. He was a church planner. He was going around in the first century and telling communities that had never heard about Jesus about Jesus. And then he would start gatherings or early churches and build up leaders. And then he'd move on to a different place. And it was just this beautiful thing that Paul's life was given to. And one of those places that Paul helped start a church was in Philippi. <laughs> he had friends in this place called Philippi, not the uh, Philippines. I know people are thinking about a tropical vacation at that point. But no, in this place called Philippi, this is where Paul started one of these churches. And, and actually, he's writing to his friends that he had co-labored with, that he had partnered with to build this church. But Paul is writing this letter from an interesting place. He's not writing it from his villa on the Sea of Galilee and just looking over the beautiful vista. Uh, but no, he's writing it from the dark dungeon, musty smell in chains of a Roman prison. You see, Paul was imprisoned multiple times in his ministry because he would say something radical, something that um, I think is still radical today. He would say that, no, Caesar over the Roman Empire, he's not Lord, he's not king, he's not in charge. No, Jesus is Lord, that Jesus was resurrected and that he is the ruling, reigning Messiah, king of the world. That's just the reality. And he, Paul would not stop telling people about that. So what did the Roman authorities do? They threw him in prison. <laughs> they wanted to shut him up. But what's amazing about Paul being in prison is that he didn't get so discouraged and walk away from his trust in Jesus and this mission that Jesus gave him. It almost like empowered him all the more. And so while he's in chains, he writes multiple letters to these churches and to gatherings of Jesus followers. And one of them was to his friends in Philippi. And we've discussed in previous weeks that Philippi was uh, not a, a Jewish area of the world, but it was a Roman colony, uh, and, and it was there to where you were supposed to always give all of your honor, your allegiance, your faith to Caesar as Lord. And so the very first week of our journey together through chapter one, we discussed how Paul was encouraging these Jesus followers to be dissident disciples of Jesus and to give their allegiance not to Caesar, but to live their lives in a way that their allegiance was to Jesus. Last week, we looked at the crux of this letter to his friends in Philippi, where he breaks into this beautiful song, this beautiful poem about the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, about Jesus' humility, about his love, about his service to each and every one of us. And today, um, we're going to look at the aftermath of that love. We're going to look at what it means uh, to put legs on that love, for us to live out that 
kind of love that we saw in Philippians chapter 2. And to do so, um, we need examples. Because this is a beautiful, beautiful idea, but we need examples of what it looks like. So uh, chapter 3 of Paul's letter to the Philippians, he says this beautiful summation sentence that is, is, it just is so um, foundational for me, but it's so easy for us to misunderstand it and completely miss the point of it. I want us to look at it and then frame everything else we're going to look at through this summation piece of Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, or 18 through 20. Paul says this, for as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, remember he's writing to his friends, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. In other words, there are people that are opposed, they're standing and living in the way opposite to the sacrificial love of Jesus. And he describes these people that are enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Paul holds no punches to describe these people. He says that their destiny is destruction, that the path that they're walking on, it is going to lead them to destroy themselves and destroy other people. And why is it going to lead to destruction uh, in their lives and for other people? It's because Their God is their stomach. It's just they're giving in to every animalistic appetite, everything that feels good. They just say yes to without even thinking of it. And their glory, they're like celebrating the thing that should be their shame. And he says this next, that their mind is set on earthly things. But here's the difference. He says, but our, my friends, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that phrase, our citizenship is in heaven, is a powerful phrase. I mean, growing up as an awkward teenager, this was like a life verse. When I didn't fit in, I'm like, I don't belong here. I belong up there. I'm a citizen of heaven, right? I mean, this is the kind of thinking that can get us to think like, well, we're just so heavenly minded thinking about going somewhere when we die, then we're up to no earthly good. And I think for so long in my life, I understand this passage just through the lens of, well, I don't belong here, that someday everything's going to be great because I'm going to get to go to heaven where everything's going to be perfect. And I just stop the conversation there. What I want to encourage us to think is that um, if we've been thinking along those lines, we've been thinking quite opposite, actually, of what Paul was trying to say. And stick with me just for two minutes because I think there'll be a lot of clarity Actually, more than two minutes, but for this little part, two minutes. Some of you are like, this is going to be the shortest sermon ever. (laughs) This hopefully will give us some clarity. Now, see, in the first century, the Roman Empire stretched from the top of Africa to Spain. And there were tons of people in the city of Rome, the epicenter, the capital of the Roman Empire. But there were too many mouths to feed. They kept conquering new lands. And not everybody moved into the city of Rome. No, they wanted to actually have these colonies that would actually extend their footprint, but people would not come home to Rome. They would instead, they would live out the values of Rome wherever they were. They would do as the Romans do in Ephesus. They would do as the Romans do in Philippi. They would do as the Romans do in Corinth, all these other Roman colonies. And so when Paul says here, remember that you are citizens of heaven, he's actually playing off of an understanding that they would understand in Philippi of being citizens of Rome. He's like, wait, we're not supposed to act like citizens of Rome? Paul's like, no, I want you instead to bring the values, the heartbeat, the way of heaven here. They would never expect them to someday go back to Rome at all. You guys see what Paul's putting down here? He's saying, no, you're supposed to live out the values of Rome wherever you are. And Paul's playing off of it saying, instead, my friends, live out the values of heaven where you are in the colony of Philippi. As we say around here at Bridgeway all the time, our goal is not just to be evacuated off to heaven someday, but our life's breath and mission is to partner with God to bring the up there down here, to bring the life of heaven to flood our homes, our schools, our streets, our community. This is what Paul is saying. See how we miss the entire point when we think it's about going up to heaven, we're citizens of heaven, we, so, so we go there someday? That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying this as an invitation, a challenge for us in every day, in every way, to bring heaven, the heartbeat of heaven, the heartbeat of God, here, in, in and among us. 
which is a beautiful, transformative idea. Like this idea has like captured my life. But it's a big idea. It's a lofty idea. What does it mean to live as a citizen of heaven as I'm also a citizen of Kokomo? Like what does it mean to like walk these things out? So because it's a lofty idea, because it's, it's such a broad idea, we need examples. We need illustrations. We need to see other people do it. I mean, isn't it true in our lives, whenever there's something that's big and audacious and something that is so all-encompassing of our energy and of our minds, we need to see somebody do it first? This is why YouTube tutorials have, like, taken over the world. Like, I don't know why, like, we even do school anymore. Just kidding, teachers. But, like, you can just watch a YouTube tutorial for everything. I mean, YouTube tutorials, they've taught me how to, like, change, like, headlights in a unique car. Or it's show me how to do things around my house. Show me how to, like, actually play Dave Matthews songs with all the weird cording and stretching of the fingers. And I can play, like, 75% as good as he. That's pretty awesome. Just by watching somebody's finger, right? I mean, it's done so much. It helps people woodwork. It helps you cook in the interesting French cuisine kind of ways that you could never just do if you were just reading instructions. Because you see someone's hands do it. You see how much and how they move and make it happen. We need examples. I'm even realizing this in my uh, three-year-old, almost four-year-old son, Jack's life, how he will follow an example and he'll imitate and emulate an example in front of him. Um, For example, something you might not know about me is um, that over the last year, I've become a deadhead. You have all the questions in the world right now, right? Now, I've become a fan of the band The Grateful Dead. Uh, like, I've just been ca- captured by their music, uh, like, watch the documentaries. Like, I've, I listen to their music all the time, like, the improvisation, the music from the 60s and the 70s. Like, I think it's so fascinating, and it, it's become this thing around our house to where uh, Jack just wants to listen to what he calls daddy music all the time, and it's no other music than the Grateful Dead around our house. We'll have lots of interesting conversations about the lyrics a couple years down the road. Um, But it's kind of a funny thing because the latest iteration of uh, the Grateful Dead is called Dead & Co., Dead & Company, and John Mayer stands in as the lead guitarist and singer for this iteration of the Grateful Dead. And John Mayer is like this incredible guitarist. He wears these like big, goofy uh, can headphones while he plays. And if you've ever seen John Mayer, he contorts his face all these very unattractive faces because he's in the music so much. So Jack, uh, for Christmas, asked for an electric guitar like Daddy has an electric guitar. So we got him this, this real plastic electric guitar, and he's all the time, Daddy, can we jam? Can we jam? I want to jam, Dad. And what that means to Jack is that we put on a Dead & Co. concert on our TV, and we stand in front of the TV, and he says, Daddy, you have to be standing, no sitting and playing, and he wants us to play the songs along with the guys from The Grateful Dead and John Mayer. And he's been watching John Mayer Mayer do this to where he makes the ugly faces. He like jumps up and down when John Mayer jumps up and down. He even had the headphones on. Like here's a little picture of him with his guitar ready for his concert. Also, you notice he's not wearing any pants because he says, he says rockers don't wear pants, daddy. And I'm like, I don't know what rockers you've been watching at all, but he's got the headphones on. He is ready to jam. And this is like a uh, post-dinner, like an hour and a half. Like, he's starting to know the names of the songs. It's the cutest thing ever. But you see, like, how he picks up an example. I mean, this huge thing of this band and this music, he'd never pick up, but he sees somebody do it, and then he starts to put it on. He starts to stretch it out, do the exercises the way that the instructor does it. We all need examples. And so as Paul lays out this summation sentence that we are called to be citizens of heaven That's exactly what he does in the previous verses is he gives us examples on what does it actually look like to live as a citizen of heaven in the here and now and spread the heartbeat of up there, down, here. That's what he does. So in Philippians chapter 2, he lays into his first example of one of his friends by the name of Timothy. Timothy was a partner in Paul's ministry. He's a co-laborer, a friend, a fellow soldier in the mission. And uh, I love Timothy because uh, Timothy is like a walking billboard for the inclusive, beautiful nature of the kingdom of God because uh, it broke down all ethnic barriers. We know that Timothy's father was a Greek and his mother was a Jew, and they were never supposed to be together. But because of that, uh, it's this beautiful walking billboard for how the gospel and the kingdom is for everybody. It doesn't matter what your ethnic background is. And Paul actually commends and gives a shout out to Timothy in chapter 2 of Philippians. He says this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. 
I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. Paul, I, I also, just a little sidebar, I love how alive and real our Bible is, that it's not just, thus saith the Lord this. Paul is giving a shout out to one of his friends, and it's in our New Testament. But there's something we can learn about why Paul is giving a shout out to his friend Timothy. What do we see here? We see, Paul says that Timothy shows genuine concern for your welfare. He, everyone looks out for their own interests, but not Timothy. Timothy is looking out for others. He's wondering what's going on with others. And it's like he's got his head on a swivel thinking how he can fill in the gap and serve and look towards other people. We live in a, a, a time, I guess, in a culture here in the Midwest. It's one of those Midwest nicisms to where um, we have like a lot of faux concern that we show people, some like fake concern, like you ever notice, and maybe it's even happened this morning at church, but you, you pass by somebody and you're like, hey, how are you doing? But you don't really want to know the answer if it's bad. Uh, you kind of just want to like, it's kind of like, what's up? It doesn't really mean anything. Uh, because if they would actually tell you, oh, my dog died, my truck broke down, and it turns into a country song, you're like, bro, I don't have time for this. I was just saying, how are you doing? But it's this thing we do in the Midwest. It's just, it's a niceism, right? Paul is saying Timothy doesn't show like faux concern. He shows genuine concern. He actually slows down and he goes out of his way to fill the gap where there is need. And so this leads us to this first element of what it means to be a citizen of heaven. And this is how we live it out, you guys. Citizens of heaven compassionately look out for others. We compare this to just being like a citizen of earth, just doing life the way that it normally is in our culture. We're always thinking about me first. What's this product do for me? What's, how's this on my calendar going to get me to where I want to go in my priorities? But Paul says Timothy is a citizen of heaven. He's compassionately looking out for others. When I think about you know, having genuine concern and looking out for others with compassion, I, I think about this picture that I saw just about six or eight weeks ago. Um, you know, the war in Ukraine is still raging on. And it's, I know it's not on our headlines the way that it was a couple months ago, but there have been hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian citizens that have fled their country as refugees to neighboring nations for safety. Uh, many of them went to Poland. And I saw this picture from a photojournalist at the train station where many Ukrainian refugees were pulling in um, in Poland. And it's an amazing thing that, um, uh, that um, Polish mothers and Polish people did for these Ukrainian refugees. Here's the picture. Do you guys see this? <sighs> Polish citizens dropped off strollers many of them filled with supplies for young children or babies for these Ukrainian women and families that were fleeing their war-torn country. Isn't that beautiful? When I think about compassionately looking out for others, oh, this is the kind of thing that we're talking about. It's actually considering the plight and the problem that others face and not just feeling bad for them, but doing something about it. I don't know about you, but often I get stuck in sympathy mode and I don't move towards compassion mode. Can we talk about the difference between sympathy and compassion? This is another like Midwest nicism, right? Like when we just feel bad for someone, we go, oh, bless their heart. All right. That's not just my grandma that used to say that, right? Like we'd say that, right? Oh, bless their heart. It's so bad. And we just feel sympathy. We're, we kind of feel bad for them, but it doesn't do anything. Like if you ever watched a TV show and it's a tragic story with the characters, you feel sympathy, but you don't do anything about it. Like we watched This Is Us and we saw the plight of the Pearson family and we just like cried and cried and we'll never cook with a crock pot again because of what happened to them. And like we just feel so, so terrible, but like we just walk on with our lives, right? Or you might watch The Handmaid's Tale and you see the plight of women in this sci-fi story and how they're treated in the future. And we're like, oh, it's so terrible what's happened to June. Look, oh man, it's just so awful. But we doesn't really change the way that we live. I think the call of Jesus is for us to like not just stay in sympathy mode where we feel bad, but we actually do something about it. That's what looking out to the needs of others is all about. Sympathy is the feeling of feeling bad. Compassion is the action of acting on it and doing something 
about it. So what does it look like for us to genuinely have concern for other people, to compassionately look out for people? What does it look like just on the ground for us in our daily lives when the trash needs taken out? Are you doing that like waiting for them to move? Seeing them, oh, what are they going to do? It? Are they going to do it? Looking into the other room? I've never done that before. <laughs> when the dishes need done, can you consider what your partner's day was like and is it a way you could fill the gap and compassionately move in to do something there? When someone in public interrupts you and they want to talk and they're like, they're just like, you know, trauma dumping on you. And you're just like, I've got like six things else I need to do. And you're just nodding your head, having no idea what they're saying. Or are you present with them in the conversation, seeing how you can serve them? When you're evaluating a government policy, something that a a politician, whether locally, state, or nationally, they're proposing, are you looking out to the concerns and the needs of others? Are you just only asking how will this affect me? genuinely concerned, compassionately looking out for others. When you're managing your finances, when you consider the pie of resources that God has so graciously given you through your pay, are you thinking about the needs of others and what you can do there? Or are you just thinking, well, if I have any left over, I could possibly do something? Or is it a plan that you make because you have a posture of looking out for others? Paul says, here, here's Timothy. And you know what I love about Timothy? He's a citizen of heaven who compassionately looks out for the needs of others. If we're wondering what it looks like, it looks like us posturing our lives in that direction. Next, Paul gives an example, just the next verses, from someone who actually came from the church in Philippi and brought Paul some gifts and some food while he was in prison. And Paul's saying, hey, I'm looking forward to sending him back to you because I know you miss him. And his name, um, families, if you're, if you're you know, having a child soon, you need a name for the child. His name is Epaphroditus. That's for free this morning. If you need a name, if you need a name, Epaphroditus, I'm sure he'll never get made fun of on the playground at all. Epap! Like, you know, what is going on there? But this is what Paul says about Epaphroditus, him being the citizen of heaven. He says this, but I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for you, For all of you, and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, and he almost died, but God had mercy on him, not on him only, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad and may and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him. Because he almost died for the work of Christ, he risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Epaphroditus, on his journey to come bring support to Paul, somehow he got ill. And then later we learn that his life was in danger. He risked his life for this mission of connecting with Paul. We don't know exactly how his life was in danger, but you can imagine if you're in a Roman colony and uh, you see that uh, someone who's saying that Caesar is not Lord, but Jesus is Lord, and give your allegiance to Jesus, not Caesar is in prison, it's probably not safe for you to be hanging out with Paul. Someone's gonna probably try to take you out and to stop this whole thing. And so we learn that his, he, he is in very much danger, but Paul says this, I wanna commend him. And I want you to commend him. I want you to honor people like Epaphroditus because he risked his life for the mission and for loving other people. This is what Paul, I think, is getting at here by bringing up Epaphroditus. He says, you know what it looks like to give your allegiance to Jesus, to be a a citizen of heaven right here in the here and now? This is what citizens of heaven do. Citizens of heaven take sacrificial risks. They put their sel- themselves on the line and they take sacrificial risks. Now I say all this and we hear a little bit about Epaphroditus' story. And I also have to say that this idea of taking a risk with our lives for our faith is um, it's something that is a very foreign concept to us today in America. Like, I mean, I'm the first person to complain about certain things and talk about the warts of our country and uh, all the things we haven't quite figured out yet. But you know what? Like, um, we're gathering here and there's no, like, government surveillance. (laughs) We're gathering here and uh, we live in a place that I've never been threatened with my life because I am a follower 
of Jesus. And there's so many things that are wrong. And I know there's a lot of people with a lot of voices making a lot of money right now um, talking about how uh, we're just, you know, a couple decisions or a couple moments away from Christians losing all of our religious freedom and we're under attack. And I understand where those impulses are coming from because the world's becoming more secular. But also, I think it might be wise for us to just say that, yeah, we're not uh, having to risk our lives the same way that maybe our brothers and sisters in places like China are, um, where there's actual persecution going on. Like, I mean, for example, just some things that are actually going on. Uh, you have to show your religious affiliation on all of your identification in a place like China. Financial decisions and purchases and buildings by churches have to be run through the Chinese Communist Party. It is illegal for you to carry a Bible with you unless you have a very specific license in China while we all carry them in our pockets, in our phones today. I wonder if our brothers and sisters from places where it's hard to be a Christian or would just look at us when we complain and be like, here's the world's smallest violin, right? <laughs> so the reality is that risking our lives for being a Christ follower, it's a foreign concept to us, but I do think there are some principles that we should carry forward of ways that we should be taking risks in our everyday lives the way that Epaphroditus did for the mission. But those risks could look like different things. They could look like us risking our comfort by actually engaging in a conversation about our faith. Actually like inviting a coworker, a friend, a family member to church with you. Actually not just telling them that you're gonna pray for them, but actually doing it right then and there. And I know there's a lot of risk of our comfort in that because what does that mean? Or what are they gonna think about me? Or what are they gonna say? But I think that's actually an appropriate risk for us to take. Might look like risking your financial security and actually living off of less so that you have margin in your family budget to actually meet needs when people are struggling. When you feel that compassion or that sympathy boil up, you actually have the resources to act in compassion. But you know what? That's going to risk some of your financial security. That's going to risk some of the luxury that we live with. That's what sacrificial risks could look like for us. And, and, and Paul is saying, and looking at Epaphroditus' example, this is what it means to be a citizen of heaven. This is what it means to spread the stuff of up there, down here. It means that you put yourself on the line. You take some risks. You sacrifice for the mission, for the love of Jesus and other people. Paul, he talks about Timothy's example of being a citizen of heaven. Then he talks about Epaphroditus' example of being a citizen of heaven. Then he points to his own story. And Paul's story, again, it's going to make an incredible Netflix series someday or an awesome movie because, I mean, the twists and turns and the character arc that he takes is amazing because he was, again, on the fast track to being uh, one of the Jewish leaders in the ancient world. And he had the pedigree, he had the resume to prove it. Until that one day where he had this great awakening when he came face to face with Jesus, that as a Jewish man, Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. And he actually started following Jesus as Lord in that moment. And so what Paul does in his own story is he talks about uh, our attempt often to build our identity and security on the stuff we do on our resumes and how it just, he doesn't count that way anymore. He says this at the beginning of chapter 3. He says, if someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, to trust those outward things that we do, I have more. Then he lists how Jewish he is and how he is in the top of any list possible for being a religious leader. He says, I have more, circumcised on the eighth day, according to custom, of the people of Israel, God's chosen nation, of the tribe of Benjamin, close to God's heart, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, someone who made a painstaking effort to follow every one of the laws. As for zeal, persecuting the church, any possible enemy he was against. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. And you might be thinking, Paul, you need to be working on your pride here, buddy, because you were just talking about how awesome you are. But what he's doing is he's setting up what he's going to say next to make the point. He says this next. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. He says, I used to count differently. I used to do accounting differently. I used to count this as a gain and this is a loss. But you know what? It's all upside down now. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more? I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. 
Paul is saying that old way of building up my life and scratching and clawing for the resume and working and producing for things, it's all the old way. And now there's a surpassing worth that I'm experiencing when I understand that there is a King Jesus who's invited me into his kingdom and I want to put my whole life under him and his rule. Then he says this, which if the original audience heard this sentence, they would have gone, oh. I mean, it would have been so shocking. This is one of the more incendiary verses in all of the Bible. Paul says this, I consider them, all those things I did, garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Our translators do the best job they can possibly do, and they say garbage. But this was a no-no word. This was a word that was going to get a rise out of the culture. It's actually the Greek word skubala. Can you guys say skubala with me on the count of three? One, two, three. You kiss your mother with that mouth? I can't believe you would say that in church. Like, this was a scandalous thing to say. The message paraphrase translates this to dog dung. Just imagine the emoji, you know, the brown emoji, you know know what I'm talking about? Like, imagine that. That is what he is saying here, which is, in this culture, you're not supposed to say that. You're not supposed to even think about that. That is bathroom talk. What in the world are you bringing up into this? But Paul's making a point. He says, I'm counting everything different now. Compared to this new life that I found in Jesus, man, it was all that bad. It was all that worthless. It was scubula. It was that terrible, all compared to being found and seeking after Jesus. You know what he's saying about what citizens of heaven do? He's saying that citizens of heaven seek the king and the kingdom first. First, like of first importance, of highest hierarchy, citizens of heaven, they're so secure in the love and the forgiveness that Jesus the king offers them, and then they're so blown away that this king has opened up a door into his family, into his kingdom, they just seek it first. Let me ask you possibly an uncomfortable question. Could the same be said about you and I? Is... Our citizenship in God's family as part of his movement it, it, and knowing him, is that of first importance? Or are you, like me often, I'm not putting myself on a pedestal, but are you like me so often we're looking for our security in what people say about us, about our resume, about our accomplishments, about what we can produce what we scratch and claw for to build up our persona, what we look like online, the things we share online, the things we don't share online, are we seeking after those things first? I, I really believe that what Paul is saying here is that, man, this is where the life is found. When we put God in his proper place, this is where the life is found. He talks about the surpassing worth of being known and knowing the king, the Lord, King Jesus. Like, it's like it's where the life is found. Let me say this, and just hear me as, you, as your friend, as someone who cares about you. I think that many of us are stuck. We feel like faith is not working for us, that we're just going through the motions because we have taken our plans that we want, the things that we want for our lives, and then uh, we bring to Jesus our plans and we say, Jesus, can you bless these? Jesus, can you like sprinkle on some of your good stuff onto my plans instead of just trusting him and his promises for our life and then partnering with him and moving forward and seeing the beautiful creative things that God does to flourish and help us thrive in our stories. But when we put him first, when we say that our identity and our purpose and our security is found in him and his kingdom, man, everything else is going to make sense. Citizens of heaven, they seek this king and his kingdom, his way, first and foremost. Maybe that's your challenge this morning. Another thing I love about these three examples that Paul gives us here, what is so beautiful, is that they're all rooted in Jesus. They're all rooted in that life, uh, that poem about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus that we looked at last week. You see, Timothy, who's looking to his rabbi, looking to his Lord, his King Jesus, and he's looking at that example, and he's not looking out for his own interests. He's looking out compassionately for other people. Epaphroditus, looking to his rabbi, his Lord, his King Jesus, in the way that he risked his life, he's looking back at Jesus, who humbled himself to becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross 
Epaphroditus is following his savior, Jesus. Paul is looking to Jesus and he's saying that it doesn't matter my pedigree, it doesn't matter all the rights that I might be able to hold or my status at all because he's looking to Jesus who did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. But instead he took the posture of a servant and here's Paul taking the posture of a servant to serve these people and to serve the mission. It's all about Jesus. It's all about emulating him, letting him empower us, being so enamored by him, and then from the overflow of that, living it out. So I want to go back to that that confusing um, but beautifully uh, challenging verse that we started with, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, where Paul says this, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, again, that phrase, our citizenship in heaven, is not meaning that we don't belong here and that we're going to get taken up to heaven someday. That's not it. But it's our citizenship is in heaven, so we've got a job to do. We are called to spread the stuff of heaven here. I want you just to dream and imagine with me just for a few moments, what would it look like? If Christians were known for looking out for others, for genuine concern, for seeing need and not feeling bad, but acting in compassion, what if we were known for taking sacrificial risks, where we take the L, we take the loss for others, we put ourselves and our comfort and our financial reality and the awkward conversations that might ensue, we put that on the line and say we're still taking the risk for Jesus and his movement, that we're not grasping to our own rights, but we would willingly lay down some things for other people? What if we were known for seeking the king and the kingdom first, where we didn't get caught in the rat race of trying to prove ourselves and trying to like accomplish our way into someone's good graces or trying to be uh, the top dog in every room we ever walk into, but we were so confident in the love And the security that God gives us because of what he's done for us at the cross, that we can just seek him, him and his kingdom first. What if we were known for that? What if Christians didn't have that MO of they're so heavenly minded that they're up to no earthly good? Maybe we just need to think about heaven and earth differently and see it more like an overlap and understand that our citizenship is in heaven So therefore, we're called to spread that stuff and live as heaven lives here and now. What an invitation. What a a beautiful vision for the rest of our lives. What an invitation.